future of mankind. Urbanization continues. It's a global trend starting in, from 1915. Urban population increased from 1 to 3.5 billion people. Soon it will reach, it's expected to reach 12 billion people in countries like India, China, and Nigeria will see a lion's share of the increase of urban population. Cities keep growing more and more. Every day we have 200,000 people moving to urban areas. By 2050, there will be over 10 mega cities on the earth with a population of 50 million people. The economy is increasingly concentrated in cities. Ten mega regions provide almost half of the global economy in cities like London, Los Angeles, New York, and Singapore generate 16% of the global economy, even though their combined population is less than 4% of the planet's population. 52% of global GDP will account for 15% of the cities. This will require massive investment in infrastructure and development. They will grow from $4 trillion to over $9 trillion in 2025. About $80 trillion will be spent on new infrastructure from 2014 to 2025. One share of this growth will be investment in transport, energy, in fast developing mega cities. Today, cities face huge challenges. Natural disasters and climate change have a devastating effect on cities and 4 billion people living there. The level of the ocean has grown by 7 centimeters by year 2100. It can reach 66 centimeters. This will put millions of people living in coastal areas in danger. Green gas emissions, uh, climate change makes people living in uh, cities uh, more poor. Ten, uh, hundred million people may find themselves below the poverty line. The aging population is one of the key demographic challenges. The share of aging people increases year after year, according to UN data. It is going to reach 20% by year 2050. There will be over 2 billion senior citizens living in the world by 2050. International migration, the number of migrants worldwide, has increased by 49%. This is above the global population growth. This affects different industries and the structure of employment. This has obviously positive effects for the quality of life and some controversial effects as well. This affects the labor market through automation and the robotization. Cities are aware of these challenges and take uh, active steps to respond to them. Cities and countries invest in clean technology and adopt sustainable development strategies, investing hundreds of millions of dollars in sustainable infrastructure, new transport system, new energy, new waste management systems, new water treatment systems, and natural disaster prevention systems. In order to improve the quality of human capital, cities increase their investment in the social sphere, education, health care, and inclusive programs create the new quality of city environment. 
from purely economic cities move on to qualitative indicators, happiness and inclusive growth. Cities get people involved in deciding the future of the cities making development decisions. What will the future of your city look like? What is necessary to remain a competitive city? What is a mega city that meets people's needs? These and other questions will be answered by Moscow Urban Forum 2018, Mega Cities of the Future in New Space for Life. The moderator of this session is Hazim Galal, partner of PwC and uh, Cities Global Leader. Hello. You've seen the video. You've listened to the challenges and the opportunities. And we've just heard a very comprehensive vision for regional development in Russia laid out by His Excellency, the President of the Russian Federation. The focus of this session that we're about to start right now is going to be about mega future cities and meeting the needs of people. How do we do this? And we're very fortunate that we have an impressive lineup of participants and panelists who will do their presentations and then we'll have one-on-one -on -one discussions. Uh, primarily, we have our gracious host, the mayor of Moscow, but we also have representatives of academia, the private sector, a former president and a champion of sustainability, and most importantly, the CEO of a bank, because when all these stakeholders come together, then we have the ecosystem that would allow us to deliver on these visions. Let me start by recapping some of the things that were presented earlier on and in the video. What do people want in cities, and what are the characteristics of cities that we all want to live in. And these needs, even though they can change from one part of the world to the other, they are consistent in terms of the human needs, starting with safety, access to jobs, access to health care services, all the way going up to what I call the Maslow hierarchy of needs for cities. Well-being, common space, a sense of belonging. These are all the needs of the people. How do we engage with the people to hear from them and most importantly to act on their requests and needs and most importantly to do this in a way that is comprehensive and inclusive. So these future cities are resilient, they're inclusive, they're built for everyone, children, the elderly, the handicapped. They're also well-planned, well-governed. They are built with the collaboration of the private sector, with different tiers of government and academia and the involvement of the citizens. We've heard a lot of very impressive terms that I've learned from, for example, building an ecosystem and not an ecosystem. The happy city. All of these themes we will see now in the session, how are they being translated within the context of Russian cities, and most importantly, how can we have an interaction between Russian cities and other global cities represented here in a two-way dialogue and learning experience. So without future ado, I'm going to call on the first of our speaker, Natalia, please. На сцену приглашается Наталья Александровна Трунова, вице-президент, руководитель направления пространственное развитие Центра Стр... Head, uh, Natalia Trunova, vice president, head of spatial development at the Center for Strategic Research. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, participants of the forum, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Sibyanin and the mayor's office for this opportunity to address you at such an important event. I'm really nervous, so I apologize in advance if I'm 
uh, not too cohesive, coherent. Uh, but still, I would like to point out what we at the Center for Strategic Research, Research believe. Uh, we and our partners, we worked on a strategy for Russia's social development. And I would like to present what we think would be key for urban development. Regions and cities are among the six priorities that we set forth in our strategy for Russia's development. You can find this strategy at our website, by the way. So I have some slides for you here. Mr. President has mentioned that Russia is one of the countries where the share of urban population is pretty high, 74 percent. This is comparable, comparable to European countries. But on the other hand, there are certain factors that make our situation special. We had uh, uh, intensified process of urbanization in the 1920s. This was during the period of industrialization and uh, many Russian cities. Uh, as Mr. Glazachev uh, called them, were initial settlement initial settlements uh, on the opening day of the forum we had a lot of readings and they weren't unique they didn't have a soul they didn't have an identity so this extensive urbanization shaped largely shaped the landscape of our cities the social landscape of our cities then in the 90s it changed dramatically we all know how many company towns we have in Russia. In 2014, the government recognized this phenomenon. We have 319 company towns in Russia, and one third of them were recognized as cities suffering from a very difficult economic situation. If we were to compare this map, to the map of uh, new industrial and high-tech technology parks, we would see that over 70 percent of them were created in the areas adjacent to uh, large agglomerations, especially Moscow. So uh, businesses are now looking at uh, different parameters than what uh, the Soviet Union looked at being close to resources, security. Now people want to be closer to markets and they need uh, human capital. They need creative people. This is the biggest factor for them now. We know that German cities face, face similar issue. We all are aware of uh, the reforms on Russian territories, unlike many uh, in rural territory. Um, unlike some of our cities, which uh, choose reindustrialization, many cities in rural set up theme parks, universities, polytechnical schools, and over 50% of the people are now employed in the services industry. Of course, our company towns cannot use this similar approach 100%. Still. At the top of this slide, you can see that uh, Germany restructuring rural territories for th over 50 years. Those programs are still continuing. It's 50. It's 50-year program. Quite often, we try to resolve our issues in over a very short period of time. People tell me we need results in a year or a year and a half. What kind of a result can you achieve in a year in a city? I don't really know. You can just plant some trees. That's all you can do in a year. Just create a new park. All the other changes require a lot of organizational, intellectual, and thirdly, financial efforts. And um, 
even a relatively small facility i'll give you some examples later a relatively small facility would require four or five years of intense work another challenge increasing competition between global cities let's take a look at the last eight years what countries have increased the number of their global cities on the map and let's compare it to national GDP we'll see we don't have Japan here on this slide but basically you see the top five countries here global leaders global cities reflect the economic prowess of the country by 20 if we want to be in the top five of uh, in terms of economic development we definitely need to focus on global cities we need to develop global cities in our country they concentrate uh, the economy innovation and human resources let's take a look at china now this is urbanization in china starting from 2010 the share of urban population increased by 16 per percent but china has been working on its global cities since 1980s in, back in the 1980s china made a decision to create 14 open port cities and currently these cities account for 40 percent of china's exports yes uh, china is currently moving economic activities further inland to the west to depressed areas and this has been going on for 20 or 30 years china has been developing its port open ports its uh, mega cities along the coast and then the chinese government announced creating the biggest mega city in the world 130 million people this is beijing then you have uh, hebei and tianjin this will generate a large share of the chinese economy projects like these infrastructure projects that serve this mega city has been started another challenge urban environment we have uh, strelka we have um, the, the 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 level of urban environment in our cities is quite low let's uh, look at the uh, cities with a population of over a million people they're well behind moscow in terms of developing their urban environment we all know that urban environment when uh, europe started implementing programs on urban employment european countries other developed countries this happened at a turning point when uh, europe turned towards innovation it's impossible to attract and retain highly intellectual human capital without a well-developed urban environment and of course moscow is the leader in russia in this respect uh, two months ago jan gale gave an interview this is a well-known uh, urban planner from the Netherlands and he expressed his appreciation uh, over what happened in Moscow in the last five years in downtown Moscow and not just downtown actually he said it was a real miracle I think Mr. Subdianin when told us this was not a miracle this came as a natural result of systemic and consistent efforts on the part of uh, the Moscow authorities and Mr. President said not many people always like this because uh, it's not nice living at a construction site but once construction work is finished the place becomes really nice we also know that there is a project to create convenient urban environment comfortable urban environment and that's wonderful of course as yet because of some organizational factors because it's difficult to work with uh, these facilities Munis for municipalities and districts which used to focus on some entirely different matters 
but uh, we have projects like parks and yards and we don't have enough projects developing pedestrian areas here on this slide you can see that prior to 1982 there were 300 cities in Germany with pedestrian centers whenever we arrive in some city in Germany even if it's just five or ten thousand people population wise they always have a pedestrian area at this center where they have a standard set of restaurants shops uh, businesses co-working areas and so on and this is very impressive this is a big challenge that we face today this is what russia needs to do of course we should consider our historic and cultural potential too you can see that 17,000 people come to the pedestrian area in Munich can you imagine that you spend 17 euro on the average per person so you will end up that uh, that's 120 million euros a year that one street can make and we can only see this in Moscow today no other city in Russia not even St. Petersburg can uh, compare to that unfortunately our transport system is very ineffective it's hardwired to transport cargo no people in order to get from Ufa to Perm you have to take a you should take a, an airplane go through Moscow because traveling by bus from Ufa to Perm is a real challenge and the road from Kazan to Samara even though it's just uh, 300 kilometers this will take you seven or eight uh, hours Mr. Sabanin said yesterday that uh, the intensity of people traveling from the agglomeration to Moscow will only keep increasing but I'd like to tell you that it's important to develop transport systems in big cities not only because people go there to work in Moscow and some other cities other cities can only aspire to this but we see a new trend in Moscow when there is a small business is actually living between two cities Moscow and uh, Tula for example or even maybe some small town in um, Tula Oblast and this is just one or two percent of the Moscow population but let's imagine that in 10 years from now this will be 10 percent this this is the kind of energy that spreads out from Moscow reaches out to areas like three or four hundred kilometers from Moscow developing high-speed transport can provide a significant boost to uh, mega cities what we see emerging around the world is not just megacities but uh, metropolises where you have three or four agglomerations connected with high-speed transportation we see this happening in Germany France Spain and especially China this slide is about China uh, where you have um, highways of 25,000 kilometers of high-speed railroads four mega policies four mega cities and their development according to our data the concentration of population in mega cities will only keep on increasing with the countries uh, countries with incomes above average uh, currently is a level of 53 cities with population over a million people so 136 cities currently it's 278 cities four cities to develop not in an extensive way but in an intensive way for them to generate economic growth to create new quality of life many OECD countries 
are implementing comprehensive urban policies. Last year, OECD published a report covering all the countries and all the different policies implemented at the national level. We see that 15 countries have comprehensive urban policies and an agency in charge of that 15 countries have uh, location specific policies and then there are five countries that don't have such a comprehensive policy what do we think is our task today our task is to formulate this comprehensive national policy in his uh, State of the Nation address and in his address today, Mr. President has said that we do need a spatial development strategy which will include all the types of the cities. We recently did a study together with Domorov, a study on economic and innovative potential of our cities. And unfortunately, the conclusions that we have drawn are not too encouraging. We collected data from 170, 171 cities, and we only have 27 cities that can be described as leaders. Some of them are cities uh, near Moscow with population of under 100,000 people. So actually, the actual number of leader cities is even less than that. If we consider Moscow and nearby areas as just one place, of course, we need to increase this number of leader cities, cities with a high potential for growth. We need to triple this number, and these cities should be the backbone of our country's economic development. As Mr. Kudrin said yesterday, we should also develop modern metropolises. Uh, of course, without competing with Moscow, because Moscow is a global city, it's a seat of government. But Novosibirsk, Tomsk, and Barnaul, Novosibirsk has top education, biotech, and of course, Novosibirsk should become a metropolis that would be comparable, for example, to. Uh, Medical Valley, other places. The key parameters of those metropolises are population of over 3 million people and economy of over 100 billion dollars. This is doable as long as we have a clear, well formulated economic policy for that. We need to develop high speed transportation for this particular purpose and we need a road construction. If we focus our road construction policies on our biggest agglomerations, the population will increase by about 10 million people. Population, people, the number of people who can reach the center of agglomeration and get higher level of services or the kind of services that they can get in a small town. We can have an opera or a ballet theater in every small town, but every person should be able to get on a bus, use public transportation and come here, not just to Moscow, not necessarily, but to other big cities in Russia. Mr. President mentioned Kazan, Sochi and Vladivostok, but apart from that we have other examples, smaller cities which don't require that much funds. This is Irkutsk, uh, Area 126. Specialists know what this is. In just four years, of course it's impossible to achieve any, every, anything in a year, this territory was totally devastated. It's very similar to the situation we have in uh, many of our cities. Now they get three million visitors a year. And this generates revenues of 11 billion rubles a year. One billion rubles in taxes. 
This is our forecast. On the metropolises and uh, mega cities and agglomerations in Russia, what we can achieve if we focus our economic and spatial policies on them. But it's not a matter of figures. The big question is what kind of cities we want to live in. We shouldn't just develop big cities, of course. As part of the Moscow metropolis, we have large number of small towns, rural areas. In Yekaterinburg and Chelyabinsk metropolis, we have over a dozen towns which are currently described as company towns, but they can be converted and developed as part of this metropolis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalia. For a very comprehensive context for our discussion, um, you talked about the Russian context, but you also talked about the Chinese and the German context. And you mentioned the need for increasing the number of global cities. Um, I remember last year in the past forum, we did a research on Moscow and its contribution to the other regions. And when you think about the Russian map, Moscow is the engine of growth in the West. In the East, do we need another global city like Moscow? And what would be the best candidate for this city in your point of view? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Well, certainly the metropolises that I demonstrated in my presentation, the Urals, the Volga area, of course, they also serve the eastern part of Russia there, uh, more east-oriented than west-oriented. In the forest, where we have 6.5 million people living, if we create all of a sudden a metropolis there that would be at least partly comparable, not even to Moscow, but to St. Petersburg, but I think this is basically impossible. We just don't have preconditions for that. We don't have economic preconditions, and we don't have enough human resources for that. So we believe that uh, joining, developing in Asia Pacific should go through supporting and and there is huge potential there in Siberia and uh, currently we have two universities ranked in the global rating uh, uh, as well as uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg this is a huge achievement and Novosibirsk universities too uh, are highly successful. So we should support that. We should uh, increase cooperation between those schools. In Tomsk, they have a special program for that as well. And currently, they started a new program in uh, Novosibirsk, Academic Gorodok 2.0. These two programs, they go in parallel. Uh, they should cooperate with each other instead of uh, doing double uh, work, uh, repeating itself. This is the key uh, task at hand. Uh, I think the other point that you started to mention is what we call smart specialization for cities. What is your DNA? What is your competitive advantage as a city? I would like to hear your view about how do you see Moscow's competitive advantage in which sectors and also some of the cities that you talked about, what would be their main specialization to really progress and become world status cities? You know, it's hard to talk about Moscow, especially after uh, Mr. Sibanin's address yesterday. 
I think this was a very important speech that he gave, and it's really hard for me to add anything to that. What I can tell you, though, is that I re just recently came to Moscow. I'm a newcomer here, so let me say something from my personal experience. I can tell you, 10 years ago, if somebody would ask me if I want to move to Moscow, I, I moved to Moscow last September. I would be very hesitant to do that 10 years ago, but last September, when Mr. Kudrin asked me if I want to mo get to Moscow, I made a decision in just two weeks. And I moved here in two weeks, because the city is absolutely different today. It's much more comfortable today. It's much more people-centered. You have all sorts of opportunities here for developing your business, for developing your creative potential, for developing new technology. Well, I can tell you that uh, you, you don't have this anywhere else in Russia. And I can tell you that Moscow is just as good today as any other European city, at least in Europe, that's for sure. But of course, there's always room for improvement, right? And Pricewaterhouse Coopers published a study, uh, a ranking of financial capitals of the world some time ago, and Moscow was ranked, I think, 82nd there. So, if we want Moscow to become a financial center, there's still room for improvement there. We need to make Moscow more competitive in this respect. Other metropolises I mentioned, of course, St. Petersburg is a cultural, creative and tourist center. Just recently, St. Petersburg published its strategy. And by 2030, they expect only 11.5 million tourists a year. Well, this is not enough for a tourist center. St. Petersburg needs at least 25 to 30 million tourists a year. Then it would become a real European uh, capital of tourism. I can speak at length about all of the metropolis. I don't think we have enough time for that. Well, thank you very much for your contribution. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please join us. Сцену приглашается Филиппе Кальдерон, экс-президент Мексики. Филиппе Кальдерон, former president of Mexico, chairman of the new climate economy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for inviting me to stay today, and congratulations for the great work you are doing transforming Moscow. Um, we are really impressed with that. Well, let me bring to you the great picture about what is happening in the world. We all are observing extreme events everywhere, every month, multiplying and being even more violent. That happened in Portugal, an incredible forest fire last year. But remember us what happened here in Russia some years ago, in central Russia, with forest fire destroyed important part of material goods and damaged the quality of life of people. At the same, we can talk about floods everywhere. And this, for instance, covered one third of the territory of Bangladesh last year, and pushing people to the poverty even more. But floods are happening here in Europe as well. And you remember some months ago in Paris, that when the cities of this big French capital was covered underwater, and Paris actually received the heaviest rain in more than 50 years. And what we are suffering in Central America, North America, and Caribbean Sea in Mexico. Hurricanes, every time more violent and every time more frequent. This is satellite image. One day, one day, three hurricanes 
killing or hitting the, the zone, devastating Bermuda, for instance, and damaging seriously Puerto Rico and Cuba with hundreds of people killed in that occasion. So what is happening here? And that's the point. One, what science is saying is, it's clearly a correlation between human activity and climate. Why? Look at this. This is a graph of 900 years from the year, from the, to the 11th century. And you can see in red the CO2, the carbon concentration in the atmosphere. It's roughly stable with ups and downs. And correlated with that, the average temperature of the atmosphere in blue, in the blue line, it's stable as well. After the Industrial Revolution, with the industry and the cars, what happened is carbon concentration skyrocketed and global average temperature skyrocketed as well in a very similar way. Actually, what we are having, look this graph, this representing decade after decade average temperature. But my point is, look, the last three decades, there has been the highest or the hottest temperature on average in a row, one after the other. And the same with the years 2014, 15, and 16, that has been the hottest years on record in North Hemisphere. So what is happening here? We are observing this extreme weather phenomenon associated with climate change. We can get evidence associated with science about human behavior and carbon emission, but to be honest, that is provoking serious impact in the cities, which is the center of our discussion. What kind of impacts are producing this carbon emission besides climate change? This is a picture about a city in Philippines destroyed by one typhoon four years ago who killed 6,000 people, 6,000 people in Philippines. Well, besides climate change, we have air pollution. It is demonstrated that air pollution are killing or are provoking premature deaths on three million people a year. Pollution in the streets are provoking premature death of three million people a year. And of course, for public service is pressing a lot health services, increasing more than $20 billion a year, the cost, for instance, for respiratory disease everywhere. And also, putting a lot of pressure on drinking water. One out of four megacities faces water stress today. And provoking other phenomena, for instance, the urban heat island. So the pavement, uh, the cars, the cement in the cities is provoking a microclimate, heating up the temperature and provoking and modifying the weather around or in the city itself like an, an island. And that could happen, for instance, last year with the thunderstorm in Moscow that caused some casualties of people and serious damages in the city. So this is the big picture about what is happening. Now, what we are not taking serious action about this. My perception is, among other things, that we need to make a lot of explanations. For most of the leaders of the world, including myself sometimes, we believe by very much time that taking action on climate change implied huge economic costs. So we needed to decide between economic growth or tackling climate change being responsible with the people, improving the quality of life and generating jobs, or being responsible with the environment. And in this dilemma, for any president, congressman, mayor, prime minister, or businessman, if you need to choose between economic growth or climate responsibility, clearly you will choose economic growth. But honestly, after several years of researching with the most serious institutions in the world, the Global Commissions on the Economy and Climate, which I had the honor to chair, we reach an incredible bold conclusions that we say this is a false dilemma. No, it is not true that we need to choose between economic growth and tackling climate change. It is possible to have better growth and to have better climate at the same time. 
that it is possible to get the rates of unemployment we are looking for and the rates of economic growth doing the right thing and being responsible with the planet. But in order to do that, we have a window of opportunity and we need to change three big important systems in the world before it's going to be too late to do that. But the objective, the objective is to have economic growth. You need to be clear on that because we in the Commission, we don't want to talk anymore about the horrible things of hell of climate change. Instead of that, we want to talk about the economic benefits of being responsible with the environment. What I want to say, my friends, is being responsible implies benefits, profits for the companies, jobs for the people, popularity for mayors and governors and presidents. Why? Because we can do the things in a different way. Let me play with some examples. One system we need to change is land use. Basically, we need to stop deforestation in the globe and we need to change some agricultural practices in order to establish more rational, less carbon intensive agricultural practices. One example, to be clear, is this. In Mexico, for instance, there was a degraded soil in Yucatan Peninsula. Now there is a huge stick plantation, which are these stick, these trees are not only absorbing, sequestrating carbon from the atmosphere, which is good for the planet, but also it's a very profitable business for the owners. More than 12% of rate of return a year in this sustainable business. So the logic behind the argument of the new climate economy is you can do things good for the environment and good for your pocket. Good for the economy, good for the climate. So other system we need to change is of course energy. We are not talking anymore about reducing economic growth, about reducing consumption of energy. Of course, we need to be more efficient, but we are talking about promoting economic growth, but with cleaner energy and specifically with renewable energy. And that is possible and it is feasible because technology is working in our side. Clean technology, solar energy is 90% cheaper than 10 years ago. 10 years ago, the cost of energy, solar energy was $400 per megawatt hour. Today is $20 to zero per megawatt hour. So it's becoming quite competitive in economic terms and so clean. And again, it's good for the environment. This is the, this is curve cost of energy currently. And it's good for the environment and good for consumers. And you can see the picture and a specific house for one consumer. And that consumer is myself and my family. This is a, a, a roof uh, of my house, which we the Mexican say it's your house as well. And we put solar cells. So you can see, I hope you can reach, this is the electricity bill in, 18, in September 44, uh, 14, and the electricity bill in September 15, from more than 4,000 pesos to less than 200 pesos. So you can save a lot of money. The payback of this investment is only four years. So it's good for the environment, good for the economy again. And the third system we need to change, of course, is cities. Cities implies a very important part of the equation. Why? Because cities are responsible, are our champions for 80% of the economic growth of the world. But at the same time, cities are responsible for 70% of energy greenhouse gas emissions. So, what we need to do, my friends, is to promote the economic growth in the cities and at the same time to reduce carbon emissions in the cities. And that is possible and feasible according with the new climate economy. Beyond that, we have tremendous challenges ahead. For instance, we are expecting that by the year 2030, we will receive 1 billion people more in the cities. 1,000 million more people coming to live in the city. That implies to build one Moscow every two months, or a city like St. Petersburg every 15 days. So what will be the kind of city we need in order to face those challenges? Basically, we need to decide between several models, but to go to take some extremes, let me explain with this. We, we have here two models of city. One is Atlanta in the United States. 
with probably roughly five million inhabitants in Atlanta. And this is Barcelona in Spain, also with five million people living there. You can see the graph is exactly the same, the scale of the graph, I want to say. And you can see the proportion of the size of the city. But the difference is people in Atlanta are polluting more than 10 times than the people in Barcelona in transportation. So the logic is, if we are going to build the cities for the future, we need to avoid the mistakes of the past. We need to choose between this kind of infrastructure based upon thinking in the cards, or we can, we can find the clean infrastructure we need. And actually, the cost is roughly the same. We are estimating in the Commission that in the next 15 years, we need to expend roughly $90 trillion in the new kind of infrastructure for cities, for energy, and for land use. And the difference between clean infrastructure uh, or, or this kind of traditional is roughly, roughly the same. Look at this example of Seoul. In the left side, you have an elevated pathway. So the government of Seoul, some years ago, just turned down the elevated highway to rescue the river. Because turning elevated highways into parks implies to put in place urban policies, thinking in the people more than thinking in the cars. People-centered policies, that's the idea. I'm not suggesting to destroy or elevated highways, but it's important to design these people matters. People is important thing in the cities. Now, the most important point I want to make, the more important is economic opportunities in the new kind of cities. We can save a lot of money. For instance, in, in this particular case, the low carbon cities and the new climate economy imply saving a lot of money for people either in transportation, time to go to get to the job, or to get to the work, or a lot of things. But also a lot of opportunities for business people. We are estimating the commission by the year 2030, 17 trillion, million of million dollars, 17 trillion dollars in business opportunity for low carbon transport, low carbon buildings, or low carbon waste management. So we can create a new powerful economy with jobs and economic growth, doing the right thing with a clean economy, the new climate economy we call. Other example, retrofitting. If you change the conditions of your own apartment, for instance, in order to establish new technology in isolation, which implies new conditions for air conditioning, for instance, smart thermostat, retrofitting buildings for office or for housing, will imply huge benefits. What we are estimating, for instance, is in Singapore, the plan is to save $400 million in 12 years. In the United States, more than $300 billion of opportunity, able to create more than 3 million jobs in that country. And actually, they are real gains for real estate. You are owner of one department, one apartment, one house. Retrofitting implies higher value for your pocket. So that's the logic of the commission economic benefits, environmental benefits. Digital IT innovation. Of course, all these programs associated with waste, the programs that I know the city of Moscow is putting in place to measure the travelers of the passengers in order to establish better policies. Technology is in our favor anymore. One last point. Everybody say it's too difficult, politically difficult, a lot of people don't accept the thing. And actually, one important leader, President Trump, for instance, rejected the commitment of the Paris Agreement. The good news, my friends, is the successful of the new climate economy and sustainable economy doesn't, rely, doesn't depend anymore on, on national leaders only. In the very same United States, almost 300 mayors of the United States are taking the lead they committed, regardless of the national policy, to hold the goals of the Paris Agreement. So my point is exactly that. Cities must be built in a new way. Transforming the cities implies to think in the future to get more connected, and that's the importance of massive transportation system, more coordinated, and I would say more human cities. And the point is, cities can take action 
must take action on climate and lead the action because the leaders of the cities now will be the leaders of the world. And finally, think in this, if we consider that most of the people who live in cities in the future, the future of the cities is the future of human beings. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Presidente, por favor. <laughs> I was worried there a little bit when uh, His Excellency, uh, the former President of Mexico, started his presentation. I thought it was going to be a very bleak image, but he shared with us that there's a positive optimism moving forward. And really, when we look at it, at all the levers that you mentioned in terms of you know more compact cities looking at the total cost of ownership and having cities really at the forefront of leading the charge towards climate change you know i stayed optimistic so thank you for you know sharing that perspective with us um, i'll start by asking you uh, a question about cars many people would say that vehicles and cars are like cigarettes people know that they're not good for your health, but we're addicted to them. And how can we start really changing some of the habits that people have around mobility, pushing more people towards more sustainable modes of public transportation? Uh, precisely, the, I think the key is to, to have a leapfrog in terms of massive transportation system. What, are the, what the mayor is doing, for instance, related with new metro system, long train system, what are looking uh, in the lobby of this building is amazing, and it's exactly the right answer for that. Because if we push the people to leave the cars without a solution in massive transportation system, that would be a big mistake. And it's going to be very painful, and it's going to be very costly in political terms. So we need to improve massive transportation system, reallocate money in order to improve them, not only metro, but also both rapid transit, for instance, which is quite cost-effective, uh, cost-benefit-effective, uh, and any kind of mobility related with cycling, pedestrian zones, as, uh, as uh, Natalia said, something like that. So that would be the, the right answer for that. Yeah, and you know, we always say if Indian cities were to urbanize the same way that Americans or most American cities have urbanized, I think this planet won't be able to sustain that development. So hopefully we'll see more sustainable models like the Barcelona one are, you know, being followed in India and some of the other countries that are rapidly urbanizing. I want to ask you a hypothetical question. Obviously, you know, you are the highest authority in the land in Mexico. Suppose you were to go back and become the mayor of Mexico cities. What would be the three main things that you would do differently than your role as the president at the federal level? Well, that's uh, very hypothetical, but anyway. <laughs> so one is we will push much more, again, massive transportation system. When I was president, we financed and we gave federal budget to build the metro, the new line of metro, for instance. But at the same time, local authorities were promoting elevated highways, which is a little bit contradictory thing. So if we can coordinate with Metropolitan Sun in order to have as long the lines of, of a, a, a underground train that is promoted right now in Moscow, it would be great change story, game changing in Mexico City. Second, uh, anything related with retrofitting the buildings, maybe a program to promote a little bit, uh, maybe subsidizing some, uh, in the cases of poor families, retrofitting of the buildings. We can save a lot of energy. Because Mexico is suffering the most uh, in terms of air pollution, that's the other thing, no? We cannot survive with this model centered on the individual cars, with millions and millions of cars, with incredible levels of air pollution that are costing to Mexico City like 4% of GDP just in premature deaths, we are estimating. So, uh, massive transportation system, uh, promoting retrofitting, and uh, one problem Mexico City has that we, we didn't address, I, did, I didn't address, which is public service, like garbage, a sewerage, water treatment, need to be improved a lot 
in order to not, not only to provide better services, but also to reduce carbon emissions coming from the bad managers of the waste um, from the water. Yep. You shared some very impressive numbers about the total cost of ownership and the benefits of sustainable solutions. What would be your advice to some of the city managers, decision makers, in terms of really promoting the awareness about the total cost of ownership and the triple bottom line of implementing some of these solutions? Well, they, it, it takes on a financial problem. So my conclusion is most of these measures are affordable, are self-pay. No, you can get back, you can get the payback in some years. But the problem, some of these measures require money up front, it's capital intensive. So we can fight to developing banks, for instance, the mechanism in which you can get the money now, make the investment, and link the economic benefits in the future to that payment, that could be a solution. One example. In the case of the, of the Korean River I showed, I, don't, I cannot pronounce the name because it's <laughs> impossible, but the owners of real estate apartments besides those streets obtain gains by 50% of the value of real estate. Maybe uh, through the tax, property tax, you can rescue, you can, uh, yeah, you can help back some part of your in initial investment. In retrofitting, in solar energy, in the roofs, etc., in all those measures, you can have economic benefits and not only environmental benefits. Mr. President, thank you very much for sharing thank your you. thoughts with us. Much appreciated. I would like to in invite up to this stage Gérard Mistralia, the uh, chairman of the board, Suez. Hi, smiles, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to congratulate once more Mr. Mayor for the extraordinary transformation of this magnificent city that is uh, becoming Moscow. Congratulations also for the World Cup, uh, very well, so well organized, and thank you for France, of course. Um, thank you. I was not on the green personally. Uh, it's a great honor for me, uh, as representative of the business, to be here in front of you all. The future of mega cities is a tremendous challenge uh, for everyone. Challenge for mankind, for citizens, for politicians, for civil society, and for cooperation. And precisely for big corporations. We have the duty to accompany the cities in their transformations and willingness to become modern and smart cities. And I would like to focus on climate change with a different approach uh, than the one of President Calderon, uh, which I congratulate very much. In my view, from the business, 70 to 80 percent of the uh, CO2 emissions in the world come from cities. And so the future of the planet is really in the hands of the cities. So how big companies like NG and Suez help cities to deal with the climate change uh, which goes uh, far beyond from air pollution, as has been demonstrated. It is a common duty to avoid the destruction of the planet due to greenhouse gas emissions. First, a brief word about NG and Suez, two companies which are long-term partners of Russia, two companies which are linked by the capital, and I have chaired both of them for 20 years. Combined, the two companies represent 100 billion US dollars of turnover 
250,000 people were present in power, gas, energy services, water and waste. And we've been, uh, for 40 years, one of the largest buyer of natural gas from Russia. And we are partners in Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. So, sustainability is an, in our DNA, in our companies. Uh, it is in our purpose or raison d'etre, which are delivering the essentials of life and being useful to mankind. So climate issue is at the heart of NG and Suez policy. And to explain that, I would like to comment on the fact that in energy, we are living a triple revolution. A digital revolution, a technology revolution, and a cultural revolution. The digital revolution impact energy as any sectors, but in energy, of course, uh, it's key to uh, customer management. We have uh, more than 20 million customers. It's true with the smart meters. Um, it's true with remote control, smart grids, because the consumers now become producers, and therefore there is a reverse flow in electricity to the grid, which is, by the way, a nightmare for the managers. So this is for the digital. It's also, in energy, a technological revolution specific to our sector, which is quite new. There was a, more breakthroughs in energy during the last 10 years than during the 50 or 60 previous years. I will uh, only mention the storage of electricity, batteries, uh, hydrogen, photovoltaic. Uh, Mr. Cameron mentioned uh, the decline in the price of electricity in photovoltaic. And by the way, I'm pleased to mention that the 20 US dollar uh, obtained recently has been in Mexico and it was my, my company. Uh, I will mention also the wind technology, micro heat pumps, biogas, thermal sensors, electric mobility, and geothermal. So that has changed radically the energy. But the third revolution, the third revolution is a cultural one and is driven by the awareness of the risk of climate change. And this is a, a growing awareness, not only among academics and politicians, but also in the public opinion, and also the municipalities, the cities, the territories, and the business. So the COP21 and the Paris Agreement has been an exceptional moment of mobilization. The French government had asked me to chair what has been called the business dialogue between 40 international CEOs and 40 ministers. And we have seen how much the mobilization of the, uh, the business has been strong, and then also the mobilization of the, of the finance uh, during this period. So this is a shift, we observe a shift uh, to a, a low carbon uh, society. And for that, we need low carbon cities. And the energy system of tomorrow in cities will be driven by what we call the 3D, digitalized, decentralized, and decarbonized. Decentralized is very much important because we observe also, due to the technology, a reduction in the size of the equipment to produce electricity and energy. Um, we have uh, micro heat pumps, uh, micro power generation, and uh, the PV, photovoltaic, is by itself uh, in very small dimension. And so it's now possible to be very close to the territories, very close to the cities, and very close to the citizens and the consumers. So how to reduce CO2 in cities? We know electric mobility, collective heating and cooling systems, energy efficiency, which is quite important, 
first we have to reduce the consumption of energy and in our company we have 100,000 people fully dedicated to energy efficiency and this can be used for example for the buildings with positive energy buildings buildings uh, producing more energy than they consume uh, thanks to photovoltaic largely and to uh, high isolation positive energy homes also and the development of the use of biogas and biomass so individual renewable energy and for example in public lighting the reduction of consumption is huge um, going from bulbs to uh, lead reduced by 50 percent the electricity consumption in a public lighting and with a smart management for example lighting when there is someone in the in the street and closing when there is no one can add create an additional reduction of minus 35 percent of consumption and of course uh, the, the elimination of coal in the cities and the replacement by natural gas or uh, renewables. We have, have observed at NG and Suez within the 3,000 cities uh, from which we are partner, two periods during the last 10 years, two periods. The first period was characterized by a massive injection of technology, uh, essentially digital, sector by sector, service by service. So during this first movement, this first period, the revolution happened separately and independently in electricity, in water, in gas, in heating, in cooling, in lighting. This period was techno-centric. Massive introduction of digital devices, digital platforms, east of connected objects everywhere. There was, at this time, the idea that the city of the future had to be digital, had to be smart, connected. This is probably true, but of course, this is not enough. This is my message. The technology for the technology, digital for digital, even smart for smart, could even be dangerous. Where do we go? What for? And for whom? So, then happened the second period. The second period is starting starting now. The second period is characterized by the integration of all the individual progress made service by service into one connected and integrated approach at the level of the whole city. And Moscow is one of the most spectacular examples of that second period. Because there is now, on top of the digitalization and modernization technology, a broader objective, a supreme strategy, which is a well-being of citizens. And this was the main message you delivered yesterday, uh, Mr. Sobayanin. And it is also clearly in the presidential strong message that we just heard. Priority is given not to technology, but to Moscovites, to the, their comfort, jobs, security, happiness, well-being. And this gives sense to the transformation of the city. People first, and then only after technology. Digital is at the service of the city and not the opposite. So digital has to be mastered by the city governance, which has to fix the priorities. 
The essence, therefore, is in politics, not in technology. And so we have been observing that as a company. And Suez is very much advanced in trying to accompany cities in this evolution. And I would like the example of a small city, Dijon. Dijon is a small city in France, small uh, 50,000 people, which is uh, 400 times smaller than the, the greater Moscow. Nevertheless, it's a beautiful city in the middle of the best wine vineyards in the world, in the Burgundy. But Dijon has a, is the example of a, one of the most sophisticated and advanced examples of intelligent urban programs. And Suez um, has won within a, a consortium the bid launched by the city for an integrated controlled command center by the convergence of technologies, covering 12 different uh, public services. For example, street lighting, geolocalization of vehicles, traffic lights, CCTVs, citizen information by iPhone, and uh, street screens. The objective is to facilitate the day-to-day -day life of the citizens by the intelligent combination of digital services, technology equipments, big data. Technology can also, in other examples, help municipalities to decide the future urban development of the city by 3D simulation. This is also what NG is doing with its uh, subsidiary Cyradel. We can stimulate in 3D, 3D dimensions, every individual project, urban project, every uh, individual decision of the municipality in the city, measure the impact of the creation of a new district, impact upon energy consumption, traffic, visual aspect, pollution, noise, and so on. And this is a tool which can be used for the dialogue between citizens and the municipalities. Monsieur Gerard, uh, one minute, please. <laughs> last word, okay. last word on inclusion. <laughs> inclusion. I consider that uh, uh, growth and globalization uh, during the last decades failed because they were not inclusive. They let too many people uh, aside from the, from the road. And in the cities, it has to be the same. And I know, Mr. Mayer, that this is in your mind. You want to create the development of the city for all citizens and therefore create an inclusive cities. You are right. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Thank you for a very comprehensive presentation and sharing with us um, not only the technology enables solutions but also the human aspect and we always say smart cities are for smart people, right? Um, I want to ask you one question about the ability of solution providers uh, like, you know, NG and Suez to be engaged very early on in the formulation of a smart city roadmap. You would remember from the boat ride we had, the mayor offered the opportunity for the private sector to engage early in the definition of the smart city roadmap for Moscow. We don't often get this chance. Can you comment on that, please? Yes, with great pleasure, because uh, it is in our philosophy. We appreciate very much the possibility uh, to be engaged in advance in the discussions with municipalities on their future. Uh, we have to provide technologies, we have to provide services, but the decision has to remain fully in the hands of the municipality. You know, the public-private partnership, public-private um, uh, contracts are developed more and more, but we have to be absolutely aware that 
in uh, the public-private partnership, for example, whatever can be the legal form of it, concession, uh, service contract, the, uh, the public authority decides and the private sector executes. That's the rule, and that, that has to remain the rule. And this will be by the respect of this very simple principle that the private sector can be useful and efficient. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. You addressed a lot of the points that I was going to ask you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Andre Kostin, Chairman and President of VTB Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to play a video. So, what do I press here? Life in big cities is getting faster by the year. Mega cities are getting more mobile. Cities require a reliable partner for payments. It has to be fast, it has to be safe, it has to be convenient. And this is what VTB offers. You can pay for public transport in an easy way now. We have a special app where you can put some cash to your add some cash to your account by putting your card next to your smartphone. VTB is the financial operator of a Moscow parking app. Three million drivers use this app in Moscow. It takes just a couple of seconds to pay for parking. You can also pay for school meals using the Moskvenok app. 90% of Moscow schools use this app. VTB provides this system. You can choose your menu and pay for the meal from the app in your phone. The Velobike project is supported by VTB. There are over 4,000 bicycles available in Moscow. People choose bicycles as an alternative to public transportation. VTB has brought together all the different services, combining them in one app. My Smart Cities utility bills, services, tickets, My Smart City, one app for many opportunities. VTB is a bank for a digital city. The people. Что значит город? Это люди. Четыре века на реке. Four centuries ago, William Shakespeare formulated the philosophy of modern urbanism. As we observe what has been happening in our city over the last seven years, I think that our mayor, Mr. Sabianin, and his team start every day by repeating this, these words by Shakespeare. Today in Moscow, their top priority is the comfort of the people who live here in Moscow. 
Moscow wins the hearts of people and climbs up international rankings. This year, Moscow was recognized as one of the most appealing cities in Europe in terms of investment. This study was done by the fun Financial Times. And uh, the investment climate in Moscow is really positive. I can tell you as the head of a uh, major bank. In the last seven years, VTB was directly involved in building over six million square meters of modern housing in Moscow. And we plan to build about five million square meters more. We are involved in the redevelopment of 42 uh, uh, hectares of uh, industrial zones. We are involved in the smart house program, a system of smart use of resources. We are one of the key financial partners in the construction of the Moscow Metro, one of the most dynamically developing areas of public transport in Moscow. I think this year 24 new stations will be open. VTB is the financial partner of some signature venues in Moscow, the Central Children's Store, one of the most beautiful stores in the world. VTB Arena won the first prize of Real Estate Expo in Cannes. It combines the athletic element. There is an ice hockey ring there, and there is a room for concerts and other events and many different facilities. We have the Island of Dreams. This is the biggest park for children. And a number of other programs. For example, we have a Moskovsky Dvoriki program. We helped uh, renovate about 40 uh, old movie theaters in so-called bedroom communities. Uh, they will turn them into cultural centers. They will have uh, cultural venues, restaurants, and so on. In time, these places will uh, become points of attraction in Moscow. Comfortable urban environment depends not just on infrastructure, even though Moscow does a lot to develop its infrastructure. Uh, digital cloud development is also important. We talk about mega cities of the future, new space for living. New space must include an IT dimension. People should be able to get high quality municipal services through the internet. Today, we see this new environment being created. The Moscow government takes an approach that enables us to develop smart infrastructure in the city. You saw some of our projects in this video, uh, cashless payments for public transport, for school meals and uh, bike rentals. This fall, we plan to launch a new app, My Smart City. This project, for the first time ever, will combine all the digital services provided by the Moscow government and VTB. All the different services will be combined in just one app. You will pay your utility bills, your cell phone, uh, traffic police fines, pay for your children's meals in just one app and it will all be in your calendar and you can pay make all those payments with one click you can pay for taxi for parking get information about public transportation schedules get updates on cultural events in moscow purchase tickets to events in moscow get involved in the active citizens uh, program sharing your views and opinions on moscow's development I, in addition to getting all government services within your home, you go to a whole new level. It's just in one app. You don't even have to leave one app. Also, VDB is the operator for the social card of Moscow, which provides certain discounts and benefits for 
uh, people in Moscow. We support the initiative to create a single card for Moscow residents. Soon we'll take the first step in this direction. In July this year, we will start gradually transferring all social cards to the same medium. This will make it even more convenient for people to interact with uh, uh, municipal organizations. The government of Moscow implements interesting idea and motivates us to engage in new projects. We expect, we hope that we'll continue working with Mr. Sabanin and his team in the next five years. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing with us all the different projects you're um, working with. Um, I'd like to hear from you a little bit more. I mean, banks and financial institutions right now are becoming practically technology companies. Are we going to see the day where there are no physical branches? Share with us a little bit how does the future for the industry look like in a mega city? You know, we have a very good old film, Moscow does not believe in tears. And there was a guy in this old film, he used to say that in the future there will only be television, no movie theaters, no nothing, just television everywhere. That's what many people say today, there will be no banks, there will only be tech companies in the future. I don't think this is what is going to happen. I think traditional brick and mortar banks will still be there even though we do see some changes and uh, we, we will soon have our first office of this kind it's not very practical but just we just wanted to demonstrate to everybody that this is possible an office without people we just want to give it a try see if it works but of course uh, you can uh, have virtual football in your smartphone but real football is something special if you go to a world cup match you see real emotions they're real people so that's i would say situation with banks is the same but at the same time you saw this in the video banks should take a step beyond uh, the traditional banking practices get more engaged with people interact with other sectors transport for example tr commerce the internet of course all those things are going to happen all those things will converge together and this will create great advantages for urban development where you can save a lot of time and nerves just by using these new information technology so banks will still be there, offices, brick and mortar offices will still be there, adorning the streets of Moscow. But new technology, uh, contact, uh, contactless uh, transactions, all those things definitely will be happening. Uh, about one third or half of all transactions are done uh, remotely. the industry. Much спасибо большое. На сцену приглашается мэр Москвы Сергей Семенович. Moscow mayor Sergey Sabanin. Friends, colleagues, Mr. Galal, seeing that we are running out of time, I guess we could just say this is it for our discussion today. Do you mind? 
Okay, I'd like to thank the President of the Russian Federation, Mr. Vladimir Putin, for his uh, high assessment for what he said, his kind words about um, the way our city has been developing. This comes as a result of uh, daily hard efforts by millions of Muscovites. At this forum we discussed a lot of different issues, but I would say there are three issues that were key and they were repeated at every session. First, our agglomerations, our cities should be connected. Second, environment. And third, new projects we can call smart city. Actually, all these issues are very much interrelated. Being connected. I'd say this is not even a trend. This is not just something you want. This is absolutely necessary for megacities today. You cannot imagine a megacity existing without having an effective, convenient transport system. Such an agglomeration would not be viable without the proper transport system. Seeing that Moscow is a center of an agglomeration of 20 million people, a center, the center of a metropolis with uh, 35 million people. Transport in this metropolis, transport connections between Moscow and its suburbs, outlying towns, is absolutely necessary. This is why we pay so much attention to building our metro system, roads and railways, connecting those transport systems to our municipal transport. To us, this is our number one priority. This will affect productivity. This will make life of Muscovites more convenient, more comfortable. This will free up some time uh, for Muscovites for leisure. leisure. And 90% uh, of harmful emissions comes from transport. So if more people start using public transportation, railways, buses, this will have a direct effect on our health situation and the environment situation in our city. Every percentage point of increasing the number of people using public transport gives you one percentage point in improving the environmental situation in this city. Every time we make a decision or come up with a new technology introducing new environment-friendly transport, this has a direct effect on the health situation of all the people living in Moscow. As we raise the bar, we raise requirements for the quality of fuel consumed by transport. As we introduced green technology in public transport, year after year we see the environment situation in Moscow improving, even though the number of vehicles is growing. Environment uh, should be our top priority in everything. Construction, for example, we've introduced new construction standards. We no longer use obsolete approaches in construction in Moscow. Our buildings will now be 20 to 25 percent more environment friendly than before. Digital technology should be implemented in our grid, our utility systems, electricity. We have new standards for power generation. All these things have a direct effect on our environment situation. We've shut down a number of 
environment unfriendly companies. We've modernized one of the biggest plants we have in Moscow, Moscow refinery. We've reorganized our utility companies, including the canal. This affected the quality of water in Moscow, uh, the situation with our water treatment systems, our sewage system. We have a joint program with the Moscow region on uh, waste management, separate waste collection. All this has a very significant and direct effect on our future and the overall environment situation in our city. I would like to point out that our colleagues who spoke earlier here today when talking about the smart city, they all talked about one thing, some very specific projects. When we talk about a smart city, we tend to think this is something abstract. No. In fact, smart city is all about using the resources and opportunities available to you in, a, in the most intelligent way, in a smart way. You need to make your grid more efficient. You need more effective transport system. You need to improve your school education system. You need better health care. You need to increase the efficiency and the level of comfort in every area, in every sector, in every dimension. And one more thing I'd like to point out. We keep hearing discussions. What is more important, the Moscow agglomeration or other agglomerations, other cities? You know, I think this will lead us into a dead end. Everything is important. We're all, we're all part of our great country, Russia. You can't imagine Russia without Moscow, and you can't imagine Moscow without other parts of Russia. We complement each other. There is synergy in our development. This is the secret of our success going forward for both Moscow and the whole country. Thank you very much.